stream going on here, so, you know, um, just for those that are able to join, they can use Facebook as a way to join in the community. Or you can go back and watch services later. So, that is... <clears throat>
solid rock Christ. Thank you for your salvation, which is not of our own doing, but of yours, God. I thank you that you have given us life in abundance and a life eternal, God. That's an awesome promise that you've made. And as we stand upon those promises this morning from your word, <clears throat> we know that we are yours. We've been bought at a price. While we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. We've been seated in the heavenly realms, given all every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm through Christ. We are called children of the Most High God. We are blessed and highly favored in the Lord. God, these are the truths that we stand upon this morning. We thank you for them, Lord. <clears throat> you've shown us such goodness, Lord. In, regardless of our faithfulness to you, God, you've been faithful to us. God, so we come humbly, we come transparently, God. There's nothing we can hide from you anyway. We acknowledge who we are before you, God. Maybe sometimes we focus upon the negatives. But we come and know that we may have brokenness in our life. We maybe have sinned against you this week, even today. Lord, we can come and receive your grace and mercy and your forgiveness, God. We cleanse and move forward. We're no longer living in condemnation or fear or shame or guilt. We also choose this morning to acknowledge those what we call positive truths, the truths of your word about who we are. And in those we rejoice, God. We rejoice in who you have made us. We have a life to live, God, in you. We cry out to you this morning in prayer and worship, Lord, you are worthy, God. We praise you.
keep us from you, that would make us maybe depressed or turn us away or make us feel like we're not worthy to come, Lord. We know that we're not worthy in the first place. It's your blood that gives us uh, the opportunity and the right to come before the throne of grace this morning. So Lord, we just come with expectant hearts, God. We come expecting to hear from you this morning. And God, I just thank you for this gathered group, that we can have a conversation in your word and draw together and worship of you, our King. So we come one of one mind, Lord, today. We just lay down distractions. We thank you that you've brought us here to this place. So God, be glorified in our worship. Be God glorified in not only in this time, but all of our life. For it's all worship, Lord, as we offer to you. Be glorified here in this church and in our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name. song for the end as we get into it this morning. I, I've been enjoying this series, and we're kind of finishing actually today, it's kind of the end of a series, uh, end of an era, era, that sounds weird, <laughs> end of a series, I guess, uh, a season, uh, talking about building the foundation, that's kind of our, our theme over the last few weeks, building the foundation, um, I kind of shared a little bit more last week on um, how foundations are important, right, and in, in, in a practical sense. Uh, and so we want to build our foundation of our lives strong. I share with our college students for, for standing in the gap from time to time, it's probably been a while since I mentioned it, but reminding them and reminding me as well that really the, the time for them, especially as a young adult, you know, the 18 to 25, around that age, especially is a time where it's about building foundation. It's about owning your own faith. It's about choosing what you're going to believe. It's about saying, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to do that. This is what I'm going to choose to do with my life. Sometimes God has fun ways of changing that around a little bit too. But it's really about building a foundation, not only in just kind of figuring out our life and kind of where we're headed, but it's also about building a foundation spiritually, which is the most important thing. By laying a foundation of discipline, laying a foundation of belief, laying a foundation of, of commitment and, 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 and conviction, all those things, establishing those things first because once as I shared last week, and as most of us probably know, if, if your foundation is bad, no matter what you build on top of it, whatever that looks like, however valuable or great it might look, it's going to crumble, right? Just like a house or any other building. If you have a bad foundation, um, as I shared last week, my dad has worked, in, has worked in construction, carpentry, that stuff for a long time. I grew up around that kind of stuff. I, however, did not really pick up on that or do very much with it, just kind of different life. But uh, my dad and, and my family on that side generally are a little more work with their hands type people. So my dad helped build a house, and he's worked on, his job was to build foundations for buildings and other things on top of it. And so knowing the basics that I know, if you have a house or any kind of structure that you build, skyscraper down to just a little shack, the foundation is bad. Somewhere down the road, it's going to fall apart, right? That's how it works. So the last few weeks, we've been talking about building the foundation. Building a, as a church, and it's more specifically as a church community, but the lessons we've been going through, I think, relate to all of our lives individually as well. Um, but building a foundation as a church that we might stand, this church, this community might stand for a long, a long time and not be, uh, not crumble. 
<clears throat> so that, that makes sense, right? So building a foundation, we've been talking about that and different things. Uh, we've some stuff on the wall over here kind of relates to that. We've looked back on our life as a church community back to 2011 when we first started. And then also over the last year, 2016, so that's the orange and yellow sheet over here. The orange sheet's kind of looking over our history as a church, kind of what has God done in and through us, kind of looking back. And then also the last year, 2016, we still have space to fill up on this, by the way. So if you ever think of something, you want to write something up there on what God has done in and through us, you can do that. We talked a while ago, um, this is the spot on the green one, we talked a little bit about kind of what, what is the lost and found church, what makes up our church team, right? So some of our different outreaches, kind of our, our makeup, as far as who we are, what we do. <clears throat> We've talked about kind of ways we can serve one another, kind of building foundation. We need to be serving others. That's important. Jesus came to serve, not to be served. We talked about that. And that kind of is, uh, it's kind of a multifaceted statement. But we talked about serving our surrounding area and serving one another, both really crucial aspects of being a church that's going to be well-founded, is that we are built upon the foundation of service towards not only our outside group, like who's outside of our doors, outside of our normal connections here as a church community, but also within the church community. We don't want to overlook one another. So we went back and looked at the early church. We did a lot of that stuff. So there's a lot there. They're all on video, so you can go back and watch it on our website, Lost and Found VR, or you can go on Facebook and see those messages as well. But what we're going to do with our last message is related to sharing the gospel, sharing the good news, being able to share the good news with others. That's kind of what we're going to talk about. I think if we're going to be a church, we talked at one point about inviting other people, being welcoming. That was one of our weeks. But sometimes maybe it's hard. Once we have invited someone into our life, we've invited them to kind of hear about our lives, you know, uh, just be a friend of ours, those kind of things. Maybe we want to we wanna eventually share the good news, right? We want to share Jesus with them in some way. And sometimes I think that's hard, even though it sounds kind of weird. But I think, I, I personally believe in the church, we know that's the case. We know that we should be sharing Jesus with other people. But maybe we don't know how to do it. <laughs> we don't know how do I do it without, be, of course, the, the standard line is we don't want to be judgmental, we don't want to beat someone over the head with our Bible, we don't want to uh, put someone off, but at the same time we want to be true to what Jesus said. We want to take the Great Commission, we've talked about it, that at length here, go and make disciples, that means you've got to share about what it means to be a disciple of somebody in some way, shape, or form. So sometimes it's difficult, so really my, my whole goal in this, this message was that we have one that's maybe a little more practical, Kind of how do you do that? So I'm going to offer like one tool at the end of all this. Uh, one way that I think is helpful maybe for us to do that. And maybe all of it, maybe you guys are all pros at this. Maybe you already have it figured out, you know, how you share the gospel people, you know. What, so maybe this is all old news, but I'm just going to, we're going to get to a uh, one thing about, one way that maybe you can do that, and it's pretty simple. Just a very relational way of doing it. Um, there are a lot of different ways, different things you can do, different things you should be aware of when you're talking about Jesus with others. But I think it starts with story. And that's where we're going to start today, is story. Can anybody think of what their, what is your favorite story ever? Like, what's your favorite? Maybe it's a book you read, a movie you've seen. Uh, what is your favorite story? Think about your favorite ever. Again, maybe you're not much into reading, so maybe it's a movie. Maybe you're avid readers and you really don't like whatever. But is there a certain story that you really like? How do you just, maybe I'm going to look at age when I date myself a little bit, or like, Harry Potter, maybe Lord of the Rings, I'm just throwing out some of those. I mean, Seth, I'm sure you have a list of favorite stories, but I what do you guys have, stories-wise? <laughs> you don't have to have a number one. You gave me a couple, then. If you can't have a, a top one, I mean, maybe you have a lot of them. So. Anybody? Currently, what I'm watching right now is Hereditary. Okay. Yeah, Alex Kerr. Oh, that's called Hayato the Time. Um, <laughs> yep. Other things. Um, I enjoy the picture of Lord of the Rings. It's a good book. Okay. Cool. Anybody else? Other story? Oh, we'll get back to that in a second. So I want to hear what your favorite stories are first. What, I mean, when I was a kid, I had some favorites. I mean, you know what the castle is? It's a kid's book. It's mm-hmm. just about Trump and Castle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the Very Hungry Caterpillar? Is that the one you're talking about? Yeah, that's a good one. I like the one where they had um, all the animals in it, and there's like brown bear, no brown bear, no maybe not. Brown bear. It's like <laughs> okay. it had all kids' stories. Things. Okay, cool. And those are the ones that at least I loved. And I went to um, Ryan's wedding like a few months ago, and 
Share if you have a story. Thinking. <laughs> or not. Do I have one? Okay. Doug, you got a favorite story? Any classic? What's that? <laughs> Charlotte's Web? That's good. Oh, that was good. Yeah? That's the one you like? Okay, cool. So probably have, I was thinking about, have you guys ever seen the movie Blindside? You guys seen that movie before? One, Oh, it's so good. I watched that numerous, time, numerous times. The one scene where they go to the bookstore, remember that, where they go in? You remember the scene, like, so the kids are sitting, they're reading books, yeah. and, um, and like, they're, they pick up the one book, and this one actually impacted me so much that I bought the book, because I never really read it before, and it's Ferdinand, right? That's, the, that's like the tie-in for the rest of the movie, is Ferdinand the Bold. You guys ever read that before or heard it? It's really good, and, so I, and it's just an amazing story, and so that's one I would probably think of that it's kind of more recent-ish in our lives, but we read it to our kids a whole bunch after that. And I'm hoping maybe that'll be one for them, because it's a very interesting, it's a really neat story. So I just, when Mercedes mentioned kids' books, I was thinking about that scene in that movie and how that kind of tied in. I'm like, I like that, because they tie that story into the rest of the movie, too, of why he, uh, like, well, it was kind of the way that he was, you know, and he had a very protective nature, and he related to Ferdinand and the Bull in that regard. So what, so then, what makes those stories, why are, why are they our favorite stories? What, what stands out to you? What, what's... What is it that reminds us or makes us think that's my favorite story? Like, what element of the story, or what do you like about it? Plot Anybody devices. can share. What's that? Plot devices. Plot devices. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Mine like the psych uh, psychological um, uh, twist to everything. Okay. So so it's kind of like yeah. Twists and turns, and it kind of draws yeah, you in, suspense, and you think you know what's suspense, going on, and yeah. sticks with you. Okay, suspense. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, one of the stories. <clears throat> I haven't been able to recently reread or finish rereading, but I've tried. Mm -hmm. But one story of why we would actually like stories as a child was, I believe, or I trace back to, or I've deceived myself into thinking, is ink art. Ink art, yeah. Just because, well, mm -hmm. it shows just a genuine, or seemingly genuine, love for literature, mm -hmm. and therefore inspires somebody to enjoy literature more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Seth, you actually got me onto that book, which is really good, and I would recommend it if no one's ever. If you haven't read that, it's more of a kids-ish book, but it's. I okay. Here's the really great thing about technology: is audiobooks are out there these days, and so you can get those a lot of times for free. So if you're like driving somewhere or like whatever, you can put those onto a device or put them on a CD and listen to them. Audiobooks are great. I listened to what was it, Atlas Shrugged. It's like sixty hours long. I listened to that book. I mean, it's crazy what you can do if you have time. So that's a good one. Yes, Inkheart, I would say, very good. And then everybody else, like, why does a story, you don't have to, but why the story is your favorite or what sticks out to you? Caterpillar's really cool. I mean, that's... Picture of Dorian Gray. Those are just cool because I remember when I was a kid, but I mean, books I've read recently, they just kind of, like, you know, keep you going and draw your interest. And it may be something you can relate with. Okay, so if something you can relate with or it kind of draws your interest, whatever your kind of unique interest is in literature or movies... And I think it's what it is about stories, isn't it? Like, when we, we can think back. I mean, we probably can think of others, right, too. If we, if we took a little more time, I'm putting you on the spot. I know it's hard. But if we read a book or we read a book and we really liked it, a lot of times I think it's like what Mercedes is saying and what you're also saying, too, about, like, so it's twisting in. It's a twisting. Maybe that's our thing, right? We like, to, we like to think we know where we're going, but then it changes direction. And it, it, just, it throws us off, and it makes, piques our interest. But maybe it's something that, so it's our, our desire, um, something that we're just really into. So maybe there's a certain genre that you like. I was telling Gappers, uh, our Gap students on Thursday, I really enjoy like, dystopian stories as well as post-apocalyptic, so it kind of ties into zombies too a little bit, but, but I mean it's post-apocalyptic stuff, but mainly it's dystopian, where uh, it's like, what would the world be like if we created this like, society that's supposed to be perfect, but it really isn't perfect, it's like, we realize it doesn't work, like 1984 is a really classic book I was talking about recently, if you ever have not read or heard in 1984, I recommend it, but... But there's something usually about it that really draws our interest. Like we're in the, at that point in our life, we like it, 
Um, it, it, it's fascinating to us. It's, it's interesting. It's not boring. Like, we, we are enjoying it. It draws us in, right? I think that has a lot to do with sharing the gospel in our lives and, and sharing who Jesus is. It's story. And not just a story. It's the story. It's our story. What is our, what is our story about how Christ has affected our lives? All of us have different stories. We, have, we are different genres, if you will. Uh, maybe we're not as dystopian. And this is, maybe this analogy is going to break down real quick. But we have different things that God has done in our life, right? So in our life, when we are going to share the gospel, we're going to share the good news, we're going to share about Jesus, we're going to share what God has done in our life, it can be done in different ways, but it's going to look a little different than the person sitting next to us. Just because we have different struggles we've been through, we've been through, through different difficulties, we've been through different lives. Maybe you've heard about Jesus. For me, really heard about Jesus when I was in college. That's the first time you really ever heard someone explain to me what this was all about, clearly so I understood it. I didn't grow up in a family where that was something we, we didn't really go to church, so I never had it around me, only other than a handful of times. So for me, that was my story. That looks different than a lot of people who maybe grew up in a church. And it looks different from someone who grew up in a church and had a really bad experience and left it and then came back to it, as opposed to someone else who maybe had a kind of okay experience and then they maybe learn more about their faith later on, as opposed to someone who was really passionate and they really got a good experience in a church setting or a Christian setting and they just kept going and they kept getting more and more um, fired up about it. Does that make sense? We all have different stories. So that's what I want to talk about. At the end of all this, I want to talk about our own, what we call a story, or in Christianese, the Christian language, we say testimony, right? What is your testimony? What is your story? And how do you share that with other people? And I want to talk about that in kind of a two-pronged thing, uh, both in word and in deed, because I think we don't want to get, I don't want to assume anything here and say sharing our story is just a matter of telling someone something. I believe, and maybe you're, you're with me on this, I believe we can share our story through how we live our lives how we act around other people. That's a part of the story, isn't it? We can share about God transforming us, what he's done in our life, by how we live. Not only by our words. So I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, but I want us to realize that maybe that's a point we need to start with and we'll come back to it. Sharing the gospel, maybe when we hear that, we think, oh, it means I need to tell somebody. I need to have a Bible out. I need to look up Romans 8. i got to read certain things out, and that's sharing the gospel. And I think there is an element of that. I think, that, I think words are important. What we say is important. We need to be able to clearly describe what the gospel is. Um, some, there are some in the church and some in different places who feel like we need to get away from this idea that it's just about teaching. It's about just doing stuff and, and showing people how much we love them. I think it's both and. <laughs> um, scripture talks about what we believe it matters. Right? Otherwise, why would we have this? I mean, this matters because we read about it. Jesus taught things. Um, so we'll get back to that. But I want to read John chapter 9. I was going to go one way this morning, and I kind of changed it kind of a little bit last minute uh, because I feel like I want to stick with the theme of story. I was going to go and look at some of the stories Jesus told, um, which are called, Jesus' stories he told are called parables. parables. Yes. Jesus did a lot with stories. Um, but I want to go a different direction this morning because I really want to relate it to a real life. Like, I want to just really tie this into like what something actually happened, a person's story. Jesus used stories to make a point. They're called parables. Jesus used them a lot. They're really great. I think those are very useful in sharing our own story with people. Sometimes maybe we can use a story that we've seen or, or maybe relate things to one of our favorite stories we've grown up with um, to try to explain things in our lives. Um, we can come back to that. But I want, excuse me, I want to read John chapter 9. And I want you to hear this, this actual story, this account of Jesus in his own life coming into con contact with someone and becoming a part of their story. And then that person sharing their story with others. This is really interesting. So again, in this theme of stories and how it relates to sharing the gospel. Hopefully you'll pick up on where I'm going with this. But I'm just going to read all the way through John chapter 9. So listen along. Pay attention. Make mental notes of some things as we're going. If you have a notebook or something or you have places to write notes or want to highlight stuff in your Bible, please do that um, as you want to do that. Um, but again, John chapter 9. John chapter 9, starting in verse 1, it says, As he went along, he saw a man, this is Jesus, Jesus saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. 
While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, Jesus, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. <clears throat> Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begged, asking, begging, asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. He replied, The man they call Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, How can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. <clears throat> Verse 17, Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and that had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it now he can see? Verse 20. We know he is our son, the man's answered, and we know he was born blind, but how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. I'm going to stop right there for a moment. You get kind of what's going on here? Jesus comes along, finds this man that's been born blind. Everybody kind of knows it. So begging in that culture that would happen, there'd be those that were blind, lame, whatever, that there would be a part of the culture that they would beg, that it was understood that you would give alms to those that were, uh, you know, down and out, that didn't have anything. It was actually considered a righteous act, like giving alms. In fact, interesting kind of side note, in Hebrew, the idea, the word righteousness, okay, we talk about righteousness a lot in the church, righteousness even at one point became associated with the concept of almsgiving, so giving money to those that were in need. So when you were doing righteousness, at one point that meant you were giving to those that were in need. Kind of interesting. So when Jesus, in another place, so when you do your acts of righteousness, um, he then goes on to talk about giving. It's a very interesting concept. Sometimes we miss that. So in that time, though, there would be people who were begging, you know, whether they couldn't walk and see, that it would be a, an act of righteousness to give to those in need, to those in need. In fact, it's still in Judaism, it's still a common concept. Um, the idea of righteousness being, having to do with giving to others. I could preach a whole sermon on that. I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> going to get off track. But um, so the man's born blind. He's getting people who are giving, and Jesus comes along, and he has this kind of inner, in this kind of discussion with his disciples about you know was wh who's sin that causes this blindness, right? They're working under this assumption that sin causes blindness, and Jesus is saying he's kind of directing them off of that idea, like it's not about that. It's about God is going to do something here in this man's life, right? Um, that's a great. That would be a whole entire session unto itself, just talking about this idea of how the disciples are thinking and how Jesus had to kind of correct their thinking on this. And then this whole idea, I don't know where, what medical book Jesus was working out of or miracle, whatever, when you take mud and put it in someone's eyes. It seems very strange. Um, and maybe we'd say, well, maybe that back in the day that was normal. Nah, it's still kind of weird. It's still strange to like spit on the ground. and you know, I don't see that happening a lot in hospitals. I don't see that happening a lot anywhere else. But Jesus did it. And Jesus did a lot of different things to bring healing. What? Putting mud in someone's eyes? Yeah, I, I know. Change my <laughs> whole perspective on things. <laughs> yeah, but so Jesus. I mean, and it's just like it, we just kind of pass over that. Like, well, Jesus made mud, put in his eyes, said, "Go wash." You know. Uh, okay. So, that, but it worked, right? That's so we can we could talk about that, and maybe there's more we can get out of that. But we're just gonna skip over it. So the man um, goes and he cleanses his eyes. He can see. All right. So then what happens? People notice that he can see because he couldn't see before. And so he continuously gets questioned. 
are you the guy? No, that's not the guy. He looks like it. No, I am. I love it. It says, I am the man, which I think is great. Quote there, but he's, I am the man. I'm the one. This is me, right? And so people are asking him, and then they bring him to the religious leaders, and they ask him, and they keep asking, are you really, what really happened? What, what is your story here? What does the man say? I love it. It's pretty simple. It's like, I was blind. Jesus did some stuff. Now I can see. That's all he said. He's pretty, it's like pretty simple. They're asking him, what's going on? He's like, this is what happened. And other than that, he just says, you know, they ask what, who, who he thinks Jesus, the guy thinks Jesus is, and he says he's a prophet. <clears throat> All right, so pretty simple. And they keep, and they're really struggling with this because at that time, the religious leaders did not know what to do with Jesus. They were trying to kind of peg him in one place. Like how, <clears throat> some people feel like he's, he's a prophet, some people feel like he's a sinner, like yeah, he's not of God at all. And so they're struggling and they're trying to, through this man, trying to determine something. And they're trying to deal with this man as well. And you can tell here also, it's interesting, the parents are afraid. The, the parents don't want to be a part of this. They're just like, let him speak for himself. Because again, at that time, the synagogue was life. Like, that was your, you were Jewish, the synagogue, kind of your, your community center, your family. That's who the, the synagogue was. If you're kicked out, you're kind of exiled from society. And so the parents don't want to be a part of that, right? Even for their own son, they were not going to be a part of that. <clears throat> All right, so we've got this kind of interesting drama story going on here. The man's just telling a story. Uh, this is what happened, and they're having a hard time with it. So I'm picking up in verse 24. So the second time... They summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. Verse 25. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? Again, they've been asking this already. <clears throat> Verse 27. He answered them, I have told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Uh-oh. Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, Now that is a remarkable... i got to say this right. Now that is remarkable. <laughs> you don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners... He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. He was gone. Verse 35, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? The term that Jesus used for himself has this messianic overtones uh, in scripture, like he's a messiah in <laughs> verse 36. Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. So I'll, I'll finish the chapter. Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What, are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin, but now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. <clears throat> so Jesus is a part of this story of this man, right? A man born blind. And he has the, the testimony, if you will. The, his story is, I was once blind, but now I see, right? The... the and amazing grace. It's an amazing story. And I love how it's so simple. All, all he's doing is just telling about what happened to him. All I know is that this man came along. I couldn't see, and now I can. And then in the end, his response to Jesus is he worships him. He finally comes to know Jesus truly. So even at that point, he didn't have a full understanding of what was going on. All he knew of Jesus was that he transformed his life. He, was able, he wasn't able to see, and now he could. What you have to realize in that day and age, if you were blind, you were pretty much stuck. You don't have so many technologies you have today. Like, you're pretty much just depending on other people to give alms and to survive and other people to lead you around as you're able, but you're not, you're in a pretty bad situation. The man was set free from his blindness that he could see and he becomes a follower of Jesus. Although he was put out of the synagogue, he was rejected by his own people, and he becomes a follower of Christ. 
It makes me think of the story of Paul. If you flip, flip to Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 9, if we hear the story of Paul, it's a very similar, it's a, different, it's a different story. Again, like I was sharing earlier, we all have different stories. What about Paul's life, the Apostle Paul? If you flip to Acts chapter 9, verses 10 through 22, again, thinking of story. Acts chapter 9, verses 10 through 22. I'm just going to read this. Listen to the story of the Apostle Paul. Kind of a little bit into it here. Already some drama has already taken place with the Apostle Paul, with, with Saul, Paul at this point. Acts chapter 10, or 9, verses 10 through 22. <clears throat> it says, In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of of Judah, Judas on Straight Street, and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Because at this point, Saul, or Paul, was blind, blinded by the Lord. <clears throat> Verse 13, Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. So again, if you remember, Saul came to uh, to this area to arrest all the people who were following Christ. That was when his he was passionately pers persecuting and pursuing those who were followers of Christ at that point. Saul saw Jesus in a vision on the road uh, as he was on the way to arrest people, and then Jesus blinds Saul. Okay, that's kind of just catching us up here, right? Verse 15, But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. After taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with, his, with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who, ra who raised havoc in Jerusalem among all those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. <clears throat> so in John chapter 9, we have this man who is just sitting there doing what he normally does. Jesus shows up, goes, he becomes able to see. I was once blind, but now I see. Paul, Saul, was vehemently against the Christian movement. He was against all those followers of Christ. Had to be blinded. He was a brilliant man. Spiritually brilliant, educated, Educated in kind of the central hub of all Judaism at that time in Jerusalem. Brilliant man of his own day. In fact, later on in scripture, he talks about how great he was. <laughs> and he says, I consider it all rubbish. I consider it all, all lost for Christ. I only need Jesus. But Paul was brilliant, and yet he had to be blinded so that he could truly see. Right? Saul himself, his story was that Christ blinded him and then gave him sight. Not only physically, but also spiritually. So much so that we, I love an Acts in that story where Saul goes from, from the 180 turn, right? He goes from like persecuting Christians proactively to now he's like proclaiming Jesus. And so much so in the story, they're like, wasn't he like just persecuting Christians? And now he's telling us to follow Jesus. That just seems like there's something a little strange going on there. And so if you go on further in Paul's story, even so much that his, his external, how he lived his life and what he was saying... People actually were nervous. They're like, is he trying to trap us? Like, they really were like, people didn't want to be associated with him because they weren't sure if they could trust him. Could they even bring him around other Christians? Could they bring him into the church leadership to, like, even meet with them? Because they're like, he might be, you know, there might be something really strange here. That's how much a radical change took place in, in Paul's life. That was Paul's story. I once was blind, but now I see And so when we think about our own story, we think about sharing the gospel, it really comes down to that, our own, our own testimony, our own story. Like the man in, in John chapter 9, like Paul or Saul in Acts chapter 9, and like many others who've come since then until now, and in our own life, we all have different stories. Paul was able to share, and I'm sure just like the man in John chapter 9, was able to share with others as he went forward what his story was. 
He was gonna, he's going to share. I'm, I guarantee it. He was probably sharing about Jesus after that, right? Well, who is this Jesus? Well, let me tell you about him, right? I was just sitting there, and Jesus showed up, and he put mud on me. It was kind of gross, but he put mud on my eyes, and I could see. And then he told me about himself. And so that's his story, right? He could share that. And that, for people, much like our favorite stories that we have, it relates. When we talk to someone about our faith, it's got to start with what we've experienced ourselves. What have we experienced of the Lord? We can go and we can, we can memorize all this and tell everybody all about these great theories that we have and the great things that, I mean, true, they're, they're truths. They're not saying theory. There's truth in Scripture. Right? That's not what I mean. What I mean is that we can have a lot of great ideas about Scripture and know it and repeat it to someone, and that's good. There are certain principles that, that are in here that this is the gospel we find, the truth of the gospel is here. But I believe what really is going to connect with other people is our story. When I share my story, and I share, you know, I grew up as a pretty good kid, I think. My parents might say otherwise, but I grew up as a good kid, I guess, and um, thought I had it all figured out. I got to college in that time of my life. I mean, I only had a handful of church experiences growing up, but I thought I had it pretty much figured out and knew what I was going to do. Got to college and realized I really had no idea, and I felt pretty lost, and I felt pretty confused about really what life was all about, and through that, I heard about Jesus through just kind of exploring things, and realized that it wasn't all about me, and I experienced God's love just hearing about the gospel, realizing there was something a lot bigger than me there, and I said, I've sinned. You know, I've fallen short of the glory of God, however I put it, and began the journey with Jesus, laying down my life and giving it over to him. And then I didn't, I didn't have it all figured out at that time, obviously, but I received God's forgiveness and grace. And I started learning from that point onward. I never touched the Bible in my life, really, up to that point. I didn't remember. And so my very first Bible study, as I became a Christian, was trying to figure out where books of the Bible were. But from there, God worked in me and did amazing things to where, you know, within a few years of being a part of different ministries, God had worked through my life to touch other people's lives, that I got involved in leadership. I became, uh, set up, got involved in set up our ministry, went to seminary and those kind of things. So, so that's just my really brief story, right? That's, that's just what I've experienced. So I can share that, and no one really can dispute that, right? They're not like, oh, that didn't happen, right? Like, so all of us have those stories, whatever it may be. Like, here's what happened to me. And nobody can really, like, argue that it didn't happen. Maybe we can argue about facts. Or, that's what happened to us. But when we share our story, it's a personal thing, and it's a personal connection. <clears throat> that, I believe, is probably one of those powerful ways we can share the gospel in our lives, is we're not trying to argue with anybody. We're just sharing, here's what God's done in our life. And also, so on top of that, I believe, on top of knowing Scripture, which is important, is having that personal transformation. We know if we've had it or not. We know that we've, whatever we've experienced in Christ, we can share that. We really can't share more than that, can we? We can talk about that we believe that it can happen, that there are things that we know are true, but what we can share most wholly and most passionately are the things that we've went through. I had this horrible struggle in my life, but God brought me through it. Let me tell you about it, right? People hear that, that first off opens you up to them. It's not like you're trying to force something on them. You're saying, here's where I am. I believe God can do that for you. Are you sick right now? I want to pray for you. I believe God can heal you. I've experienced healing in my own life. Does that make sense? The stories that we have of our own life. But on top of that, on, on, with that, it also has to come our living as well, right? I'm not, no, what I'm saying in that is not that our testimony needs to be perfect living. All right, we got it all figured out, so we're going to impress everybody how awesome we are. No, it's about letting our lives line up with our testimony, right, with, with who we believe Jesus is. We believe that God is, <clears throat> whatever we believe, our lives should line up with that, or we should be working towards getting those two things aligned up. So unconditional love, we know that Jesus said to love one another as he's, as he's loved us, as I said earlier. So are we living other, loving other people unconditionally? You might be having a hard time with that. But that's a part of living out the gospel. Right? If people see us living unconditional love towards one another, that's going to make a difference. If we just talk about it a lot but don't do it, what is that? Hypocrisy. And it actually turns people away from the gospel. So thank God for grace and <laughs> his mercy that he works through uh, imperfect vessels like us. He's able to do that. Transform living. As we continue to be transformed more like Jesus, people see that Weren't you that person that was like that? Right, the blind man, right? Weren't you once blind, but now you can see? 
weren't you once like really struggling with this thing, but now you seem pretty free from all that stuff. What happened? Right? You used to be like really angry all the time, but now like you just have this joy and this peace. Or I mean, I've seen you like you used to be really angry, and then it's even kind of gotten better over time. What's going on? It's Jesus. Right? The word and deed. Sharing the gospel with your word and deed. <clears throat> so as I share my own, I'm going to leave us with this kind of our testimony. Think about it this way. Have you ever actually shared have you ever shared your story with someone else? Like shared like how Jesus is in your life? Hopefully we've had at least a chance. I'm not sure how, how precise it was or how long it took you to share it. There's a way of making it pretty simple, and I, I was actually given this kind of tool a long time ago. Is think about it this way. Think about it kind of in our, our B C A D, right? So you know like how time like history goes from B C, so it's like time stuff happened back in B C days. And then now we're like in 80, so we're in 2017, 80, right? 80, 2017. Think about it that way. If you're going to share your story, if you could shorten it down into a really short story you could share with anybody, think about it that way. What, ha- what was your BC life, right? The before Christ. <laughs> your BC days. What was it like? Maybe it was very short. Maybe not much of a memory of it. Maybe if you grew up in the church, there's not a lot of BC. But maybe you could think about, you kind of, before you really kind of owned it for yourself, how would you share that with someone? Your BC. Before I knew Jesus, before I really had owned my faith, I was kind of just, this is kind of where it was. I believed this, I did this, right? This is our testimony. <clears throat> so that's the first part. If you're going to share your testimony with someone that you love, you're going to share the gospel with somebody in a relationship, whatever it might be, a friend, coworker, family member, classmate, somebody you meet on the street, you start having a conversation, something comes up, you can bring that to a uh, conversation. So BC, whatever that looks like for you, just keep it in that. So that's number one. Number two, the cross. <clears throat> when you experience Jesus for real for the first time. What was that like? What was your cross moment when you finally realized what it was all about? <clears throat> How did you experience that? Was it someone sharing something with you? Was it you reading a verse in the Bible? Was it a sermon that you heard? <clears throat> was it just kind of like a, a series of events that took place? Was it, a, was it a Sunday school lesson? Was it somebody asked you, do you really believe this? And you said yes. That's kind of my story, actually. Someone, I kind of left that out of my earlier one, but I knew a girl. She said, Are you, gonna, you know what it is. What are you going to do? Are you going to follow Jesus or not? I'm glad she asked me that question. <clears throat> I said yes. In the dorm room, September 15th, 2000. I said, all right. So that's our cross. What is your cross moment? What was your BC, number one? What is your cross moment? What was it like? Was it a series? Was it one moment? And then your AD, right? After death, right? After you died to yourself, what is it like now? How would you describe your life today? Still struggling with things, but Christ continues to work in my life. Still seeing awesome things going on, and that's what God has for all of us, right? See how simple it is to share your testimony? It's pretty simple. B.C. of the cross, A.D. You can do that. You can do it in a couple minutes. Sometimes I don't think we think about that. We think we've got to have some kind of elaborate plan, elaborate story we need to make up, or not make up, but like we have to have something. We need to get all these scriptures in order. Yeah, there's some things we should share, but what is, it? What is your story? What is your testimony? So I challenge us to have that. Think about that a little bit. This week, as you go forward, what is your testimony? What is your BC? What is your cross moment? What is your AD? What is it after you, AD, kind of after death? What is it after you've died yourself, after the cross? What does your life look like? And how would you share that with somebody else? Could you shorten it down just a couple minutes, three or four minutes, just in a general conversation you could share it with somebody? Even write it down, outline it. That's number one. That's my challenge this week is have a te- think of your testimony. What is it? So you should be able to share that with someone. It's a very practical step because you're inviting someone into church. You're inviting someone in your life to share God's love with them. What is your story? And number two, let's think about our, our own lives. What do we, where in our lives, our outward deeds, do we need transformation? If we're not, our, lives are aligning, our lives are lining up with our testimony, with, with Christ, what do we need that, to God to do it in our life right now? Are we having issues with <coughs> anger? Are we having issues with lacking patience? Are we having issues with, with what is it? I want to ask God right now, to, I'm going to pray for us, that God will give us opportunity to share a story and also um, to help us in our outward, our deeds, as we continue to seek his transformation in our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, that you are working in our lives day by day. <clears throat> thank you that we see these stories throughout your word of people being transformed, you transforming others' lives. And Lord, you've done the same in our lives. Maybe it looks different. Maybe we weren't blind and had mud put on our eyes. Maybe we have. Maybe a great story here. But whatever it is, God, whatever stories that we have, whatever we come with, 
Those are our stories. And they're unique to us. Lord, I pray that you would give us opportunities to share those stories of what you're doing in our life with others. What you have done. What you're continuing to do. And that you use our testimonies, you use our stories to reach other people. You can share the good news with them. They might come to People might come to know you through our testimony. That's my first prayer for us, that you give us opportunities, even this coming week, to share the, our story with others. And number two, I ask, Lord, that you would, if we're right now sitting here and thinking about, man, my life just isn't lining up, you know, I, I know probably my testimony outwardly, my, my, added, my actions, if you're lining up, but Lord, I just pray first off that we'd be able to come humbly and, and openly and be able to lay that down. Instead of feeling all guilty and, and shameful about it, if that's an issue we're facing, we lay it down, receive your grace, we walk free, <coughs> away from all that, and that we then open ourselves up to your transforming power. Now, these are addictions, these are issues that we're dealing with, they're just struggles we've been dealing with for a long time, where we open ourselves up to you right now. And as you begin to work on our hearts and our minds, continue, you continue right now or start to work on us, revealing the truths of who we are. We pluck out all the lies that we, have, that we believe that maybe has brought us to this point, or whatever it may be. Set us free. Give us sight. Help us to see. So we might go forward in wholeness. Truly be your hands and feet in this world. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. <coughs> Jesus be it all. Fitting song, kind of finished. Reflecting on what Jesus has done for us.
and keep your blood which washes us white as snow and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We seek you, Lord, and we seek you and you alone. Let nothing stand between you and us in our lives, as a church, as well as individually, that as we go this week, would you lift up one another in prayer, God? We trust our lives to you until we gather here together again, and whether we, wherever we may see one another again, as we serve you and your kingdom, as we serve alongside one another. We give you all the praise, all the glory and honor. God, we just commit ourselves again to you. I pray a blessing over each and everyone here, as well as our, our extended community who are not here with us this morning, gathered via Facebook Live or whatever it may be. A blessing you might continue to work in and through us for your glory, for your kingdom's sake. In Jesus' name.